Hi, good morning. My name is Marianne Katz, and I'm connected here at Calvary with the women's ministry. Today's reading is from Galatians 5, 16 to 26. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissension, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, and being one another. Thanks. Well, good morning. My name is Brody Young. I get to serve on staff here at the Thornton campus. So glad that you're with us this morning. We've been in this series going through the statement of faith here at Calvary, looking at some of the most essential things that we believe as a church. And we've been going through these individual articles, looking at what are some of these most essential things. And I know I've been blessed these past weeks to have some of our incredible pastors and, and, and preachers from the Erie and Boulder campus to lead us through these articles. And so a couple of weeks ago, or a few weeks ago, we had Pastor Gary was out here talking about God the Father, talking about how marvelous he is in his creation, the one who sends the Son and the Spirit. And he had that illustration, if the earth was a golf ball, talking about how powerful God's creation is. And then we had Thomas out here to talk about the role of the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit that we oftentimes don't even think of as a person, but how the Holy Spirit is the presence of of God with humans. He's the one that comes and indwells and is physically present with humans. And then last week, Pastor John was out here to talk about the sun, the way that we see God, God as a human, fully God, fully man, the way that we see the Trinity. And we've had all this information, and maybe your mind is exploding because you're like, uh, I don't, how do these things go together? There's three persons, and together they're one God. They're one unified, equal, powerful being that we worship. And if we were to have all of that information, and our minds to be loaded with all this knowledge and this theology about who God is, and yet our lives never to look more like him, then we'll have failed. We'll have missed the mark with this series, going through what we believe, because the goal is that our lives can be shaped by this God that we look at. Our lives will be shaped and to become more like him. And so this morning, that's our task, is that as we, uh, we've been going through these individual articles, this morning's gonna look a little bit different, where we're not gonna have a specific article that we're going to look at together, but rather to look back at those previous articles, to look back at who God is, to see what our lives as a church might look like. Now there's this running metaphor that, happens throughout the Bible. We see this a lot in the Old Testament, in particular in the book of Isaiah, about this tree. This tree that's growing fruit, or maybe it's being cut down because it's not growing fruit. It's not doing what it's supposed to. It's, it's a useless tree. And then in the New Testament, Jesus in, in the Gospels kind of picks up on this metaphor and continues it. And he says, actually, it's, it's like a, a vine. And there's branches attached to this vine. And these branches, as long as they're attached to the vine, they're abiding in the vine, they're going to grow fruit. It's gonna bear fruit and it's gonna be abundant. I lived in Chicago for a number of years and by far the coolest place that I lived when I was in Chicago was this neighborhood called Chinatown. And maybe you've seen like on a television show or a movie or maybe you've even been to visit when you've been in a downtown city area 
to see a neighborhood like this where the culture is, is Chinese, right? There's, there's Chinese restaurants and Chinese agriculture and architecture and all these different things. And it's really this unique environment in the middle of downtown Chicago where you're like, whoa, this, this feels totally different from anything like this. And my favorite part of living there was the gardens because the gardens were some of the most unique gardens I've ever seen in my life. I'm, I'm pretty tall, I'm just over six feet. And as I would walk through the neighborhood that I lived in, there were these vertical gardens. And these gardens would grow eight, 10, sometimes 12 feet high. It's not like these, these sprawled out community gardens, but they were these vertical gardens. And so you'd walk through and you're like, whoa, this, this is so big, like they're so high up there. And on, on those vertical gardens would grow these fruit called bitter melon. And bitter melon is like this hybrid. It's like a, a mix between a watermelon, picture like a mix between a watermelon and like a cucumber, and you've got a bitter melon, but they're huge. They're so big, and they'll just like sit up there, and you're like, if that thing fell, that would just kill me. Like, it would just destroy me. But they, they grow these massive fruit. And so you'd walk through the neighborhood, and it was so beautiful, because you've got these gardens and this nature all around you, and these flowers all around you. It's really incredible to see. And then at the end of the block was my least favorite home. Now, you'd be walking through the neighborhood looking at all the gardens and seeing everybody out working on their gardens. And then you get to the end of the block and there was this one home where I never met the homeowners. I never saw them out and about. There was no gardens at this home. There was no fruit. There was no, no maintenance that needed to be done. I never saw them out working on their front yard. In fact, there wasn't even any grass in this yard. But instead what there was, was this fake square of artificial grass. And I'm not even talking like the good artificial grass, like Colorado, you guys know how to do this well. You're like, we live kind of in the desert, so we've got to get grass that's fake that looks like real grass. This is not that kind of grass. This is like the kind of grass you put inside your house, like on your living room floor, and you get your putter out and you work on your golf swing on this kind of grass, okay? This is like the fakest grass you've ever seen. And the thing that annoyed me about it was that it didn't fit in with the rest of the neighborhood. It didn't look right. There's just something off when you get to this house. You're like, huh, that doesn't quite look how it should. And it was easy. There was no maintenance to be done. There were no weeds to pull. There was no ground to dig, no rocks to move. But it wasn't alive. It was dead. There was nothing fruitful about it. There was nothing that grew. And my friends, the Christian life is not meant to be like this. It's not meant to be easy, low maintenance. It's not meant to be dead. It's meant to be alive and abundant and growing and fruit. And so today we're going to look at a passage in Galatians where the Apostle Paul is going to talk about this. He's going to talk about this fruitful, abundant life for the Christian. He's going to say that the secret to a fruitful, abundant life is a life yielded and surrendered to the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. That people who yield to the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives bear good fruit. And so if you want to turn to Galatians chapter 5, we're going to be there this morning and we're going to read through verses 16 through verses 26 together. We'll have it up here on the uh, presenter as well. It begins in verse 16. Galatians 5, 16, it says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Paul begins here. He's saying there's two kinds of desires in the heart and the mind of every Christian. There's two kinds of desires. There's these desires of the flesh, these things that we're naturally bent to, and there's these desires of the Spirit. This new desire that comes when the Holy Spirit comes upon a believer, when you believe in Jesus and have a relationship with him, the Holy Spirit comes and gives you these new desires. And so every Christian has this going on in their life, but they're not meant to coexist. 
There's a war going on. In fact, they're opposed to one another, it says. They're at war with one another. They're fighting. Every Christian has these, and this is the human story. This is even since the garden with Adam and Eve, right? Humans have had this story all through history that we're tempted to take things that belong to God and to take them for ourselves. To take things that God makes, things that are good and beautiful and rich, and to say, that's mine. And so we take our bodies and we say, that really belongs to me. We take possessions and we say, you know, these really should belong to me. This, my time, really, it should belong to me. All this creation around me should really belong to me. And since the beginning of time, humans have had this propensity to rebel and to try to become the authority of our own lives, to take what's God's and make it our own. And this is the desires of the flesh, to take what's good and to make it our own. The desires of the flesh, every Christian has this. It's in the mind of every human. And Paul's gonna go on, he's gonna list what some of these works of the flesh look like. What does this look like in our own lives when we're tempted to take things and twist them and make them about us and not really about God? And he says, the works of the flesh are evident. It's sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And I'm sure there would be nothing more fun for us this morning than to go through this list in excruciating detail and talk about everything in here and what this looks like in our own lives. However, we're not gonna do that this morning for the sake of time. We're gonna make a few observations about this list together. And the first thing is this. We see this in verse 21. Notice the very end, it says, and things like these. Things like these. And the reason that line, I think, is important is it tells us a couple of things about this list of the works of the flesh. The first is that it's not an exhaustive list. It's not like, oh, this is, this is the end of that list. Like, these are the exact things that you need to worry about, right? Like, there could be more things in your life that are not listed here. But the point of this list isn't the nature of the exact specific sins. It's not to say that we need to focus on whatever that one that jumps off the screen to you. Oh, anger. Man, that's the one. That's the one I've got to really go home. That's the one I've got to really pull the weeds out and really get rid of this, this vice that entangles and destroys my life. That's not the point, is to put on our, our glasses and have to obsess over this list and to write it, write it down in our journals and really focus and meditate on this list constantly. It isn't to say that we should become obsessed with it. The point is this, that the works are evident. The works of this list of the flesh are evident in the life of a person. That your life is a story your life is a story, and it will continually tell the tale of which side is winning this story. There's these two desires. Which one is winning? Which one is continually telling the tale of your story? When people look at your life, what do they see? Do they see it overwhelmed by this list? Because for people who don't have the spirit, our lives can tend to look more like this. This is our natural inclination is to do these things as humans, but as humans, how you fight the battle against the flesh matters, how you combat the nature of the flesh, the works of the flesh matters. And so how do I remove these vices? How do I remove these sins, these actions from my life, these, this enmity and strife and anger? How do I pull these things out of my life? I think as Christians, our, our tendency oftentimes is actually to hyper-focus on this list, to look at it and be like, okay, what's the one that jumps off, off this list? It, is it, it might not be sorcery, but maybe it's, may, maybe it's jealousy, right? Maybe it's jealousy. I, I don't want to assume. I don't know everybody in this room that well, but, but it's probably something like jealousy or anger, right? That's the one that jumps off that list to us. And our tendency is to say, man, that's the one. I'm going to really focus 
on getting rid of the anger in my life. I'm gonna, this week I'm gonna really try hard not to get angry this week when people are bothering me or somebody says something rude to me. But the problem with that is that there's people who have tried that. They've tried to just really focus on the bad and say, you know, we'll get rid of these things. And in fact, Paul is speaking with some of those people in mind throughout the entire book of Galatians, this letter to the Galatians. And so just a a little bit of background really quick. Paul's written this letter to the Galatians where he's planted this church. And now Paul's left and he's gone on, he's moved on to somewhere else to do more work and plant more churches and all that. But there's this multi-ethnic church that exists in Galatia. Because Jesus comes and he brings the gospel to the Jewish people and then it's expanded to include the Gentiles. And the Gentiles, it's basically this fancy word to say anyone that's not a Jew, right? Anyone that's not a Jew. So you've got this this church of Jews and Gentiles worshiping together in this multi-ethnic community. And Paul loves these Christians in Galatia. He started the church there. And so he's writing this letter back to them trying to give them some instruction. But there's a second audience that Paul has in mind when he writes this letter. Because there's another group that's come into the church and has begun to influence the Christians who are there in Galatia. And they they have a couple of names. Uh, One of those names is that they're called the Judaizers, or those of the circumcision. They're these, these Jewish Christians who have followed the Mosaic law for their whole lives. And so they, in particular, they really believe in the act of circumcision, like that is the way to do it. And you can imagine these Judaizers, when they read this list, this works of the flesh, these, you know, sorcery and jealousy and divisions and rivalries and drunkenness, they're appalled by this list. They're like, if anybody wants to get rid of these things in the church, it's us. We've been following the law, right? Like this is the way to get rid of all these things is you've gotta follow the law. And so what they did is they come, they come into the church and they say, okay, Gentiles, you need to follow our moral practices. You need to do what we do. You need to be circumcised and to follow the law and that is how we're gonna get rid of all of this sin in our community. And so Paul has both of these audiences in mind when he's writing this letter. But the problem is, that how you combat the flesh matters. And what Paul's doing is he's shining a light on the half-truth of these Judaizers. The half-truth that you can remove a little bit of sin here and there by effort. But effort alone is not going to cut it. That you can remove a little bit of sin here and there, but you can't be alive apart from the Spirit. You can't bear fruit apart from the Spirit. You can't have an abundant life overflowing with fruit apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. There was a famous pastor in the 1800s. His name was D.L. Moody. And D.L. Moody had this pretty large church, and so he would oftentimes speak to a couple thousand people. And one time when he was speaking to his church on this passage, he held up a glass to the church and he said, who can tell me how to get the air out of this glass? And he began to take suggestions and one man puts his hand up and says, you know, you've gotta get a pump, you've gotta suck the air out of there. And he said, you know, the glass isn't really designed for that, it'll, it'll become a vacuum and the glass will probably break. You know, that's not what it's made for. And he, he took a few more suggestions and then as people continue to make suggestions, he just quietly pulled out a pitcher and began to fill the glass. And then he smiled and he said, the air has been removed. It's not enough to just pull out a little bit of sin here and there. But our life needs to be filled with something new, something better, something filled with life. And so the key to a faithful, abundant, victorious life as a Christian is being filled with the life of the Spirit. It's being filled with something new and better. And in verses 22 through 23, Paul's gonna go on and he's going to describe what this life 
looks like. So if you'll turn there with me, verses 22 and 23, it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. And what Paul's saying here is that when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of your life, when the Holy Spirit really grabs hold of your life, begins to mold your life, transform your life, rewire your life, this is what that fruitful, abundant life will look like. I love the way that Tim Keller described this list that we have here. He said that this list is the parts of God that you can catch. And at, at risk of bringing up trauma from the past few years, I think we're, we're familiar with this after COVID, right? Of if you're in a room with somebody, you might catch what they have, right? If you have little kids, maybe you've been in a room and you're like, yeah, I'm gonna catch what they have. If you're hanging out with a bunch of kids, right? They're grubby and they're holding on to stuff and handing you stuff, right? And so we're familiar with this, but there's parts of God, when we think about God, that we will never be like. He's all powerful. He's all-knowing. We, as humans, will never be all-powerful. We'll never be those things about God, but there are parts of God that he shares of the abundance of his grace with his creation, with humans. He shares his love, his patience, his kindness, These are the things that if you get close, if you're surrounded by the love of God, you might catch a little bit of it. If you're surrounded by the kindness of God, Lord willing, you will become a more kind person. These are the parts that hopefully we as a church can become more and more like as we look at God. We'll become more like him. But there's one major difference in this list that's a little bit different from the previous list. You may not notice it because it's actually pretty subtle, okay? So you've got this list of the works of the flesh, and now we've got this list of the fruit of the Spirit, and there's one difference. Notice it doesn't say the fruits of the Spirit are, what does it say? The fruit of the Spirit is. It's fruit. It's singular. It's one fruit from nine different aspects. In other words, this isn't a nine-step plan for you to go home and work on love, joy, peace, patience. It's not something where you can go home and really focus in on, again, the one that jumps off the screen. Oh, I, I need to be a more kind person this week. And so, okay, you know what? I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna write anger on my mirror and really try to not be angry this week. What I'm going to do instead, I'm going to write patience on my mirror. That'll, that'll do it. I'll write patience on my sticky notes, and I'll put that in my Bible or in my kitchen so I see them, and that's the one I'm going to really focus on this week. And if I can just do that, man, that'll, that'll do the trick. That'll get rid of the anger that I've been dealing with. But it's not a nine-step plan. It's not nine different fruits. You can't just focus on love but have no self-control. You can't be the most joyful person in the world but have no patience. It's a package deal. It's like a good insurance company. It'll bundle it for you. (laughs) And so you can't have one without the other, right? It's like a beautiful painting. You can look at it from nine different angles and see nine different beautiful aspects of this one fruit. And so let's take a look at what some of this fruit looks like. What are the different aspects of this fruit as we see it? Well, I think we're probably familiar with a lot of the words on this list, but let's just briefly look at what some of them are. Love, what is love? Baby, don't hurt me. Don't hurt, it was right there, I had to do it. All right. But if you're familiar with the four kinds of love, right? There's a, there's a wonderful book called The Four Loves, and there's, there's four words that are used for love in the Greek New Testament. And this is the one that is called agape love. It's this unconditional love. It's a love that's based outside of ourselves. It says that no matter how you treat me, how you act towards me, I'm going to be loving and sacrificial towards you. This is the love 
that God demonstrates towards us. That even though we despised him, he loves us and sacrificed himself for us unconditionally. Unconditional love. Joy and peace. These two, I think, are are really similar. They're related in that they're both decisions that are rooted outside of myself. They're not rooted on in the conditions that I'm experiencing. So we know this, like joy is not dependent on the circumstances of my own life. Rather, it's placed in who God is and why he's placed me here. That I can take delight in God no matter the circumstances that I am going through. And there's a lot more we could say about that, right? About how challenging that actually is, but regardless, we can take delight in God. Peace is really similar. It's, it's a confident trust in God and who he is that he cares and he provides, regardless of the circumstances going on. So you see that both are, regardless of what's happening around me, I can take delight in God and I can trust God. Joy and peace. Patience and kindness, these are both relational terms about how I act towards others, how I respond towards others. Patience is a willingness to endure difficult circumstances. Somebody who's annoying, aggravating, causing me pain, the ability to be enduring with them, to be forgiving towards them. Kindness, it's an outward consideration of other people having a generous spirit towards other people, a tenderheartedness towards other people. Goodness, being devoted to living to God's standards, God's moral excellence, the way he wants me to live. Faithfulness, being dependable all in, all the time. One who's trustworthy towards God gentleness. Perhaps a better way to translate this, a lot of Bibles do translate this meekness, humility. This is a a non-self-focused life. In other words, it says, I'm not the center of the universe. God has put me in this world with other people, and his plans are central. It's not my plans that are central. It's a non-self-focused life. And self-control, the ability to choose the important thing rather than the urgent thing regardless of external pressures that I may be feeling, regardless of what my desires are telling me to do, it's the ability to remain confident in the most important decision rather than the urgent one. And the Christian who walks by the Spirit, their life will be bursting forth with this fruit. It'll be abundant, bearing, and growing this fruit. But if we walk out of here today and we say, okay, I get it. Don't pull the weeds out. Don't just try to pull out the sin. Don't just try to suck out the sin. I'm gonna really try to put on these new things. I'm gonna try to put on this new love and patience and I'm gonna gonna really focus on pulling up my bootstraps this week and getting better at these things. And again, I think we'll have missed the mark because we can't do it on our own. It's not about what you can do or what you have done or what you will do this week. That's why Paul began by saying this in verse 16. It says, but I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. How do we not gratify the desires of the flesh? These desires that are still in us, that we still experience, well, Walk by the Spirit. Verse 18, but if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. It's not about your effort. You can't just earn your way in the eyes of God, which if I can make a quick note about that, really quick actually. God isn't opposed to effort. Like the Apostle Paul, Jesus, they're not opposed to effort. Some of you put in effort to get here this morning. You got up, you got out of bed, you brushed your teeth, you maybe even got here with kids. Like you put in effort effort to get here this morning. Praise God. Some of you more effort than others, but you're all here. God is not opposed to effort, but what he is opposed to is relying on your own effort, because grace isn't opposed to effort. Grace is just better than effort. 
Christ works through our effort. And so he's not against effort, but what he's saying is you need to rely on the Spirit. You can't try to improve yourself in the eyes of God this week by your effort and your trying. It's not going to work. You can't just try to put on this fruit of the Spirit. You can't just try to pull out the sin. It's not going to work. And so now we see this theme of walking, being led by the Spirit, continue in verses 24 and 25. It says, And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. If we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Maybe you've experienced this with a kid where you're, you're walking with them or maybe you're about to cross the street and you're like, come on, keep, keep in step with me. Don't, don't fall behind. Walk with me, stay with me because you know that if you get too far ahead, they're not gonna know where to go. They're not gonna know what to do. And this is the image of the Spirit leading us, walking with us, keeping in step with us. If we live by the Spirit, we need to keep in step with the Spirit. In order for us to bear spiritual fruit, to be these, this abundant, fruit-bearing people, two things need to happen. According to these verses, two things need to happen. The first is that we need to crucify the flesh, that old desire that's at war with the desires of the Spirit. We need to crucify it, put it to death. And secondly, we need to keep in step with the Spirit, the way the Spirit's going well, how do I do this? You've just spent 20 minutes telling me how I can't do it on my own effort. I can't just pull out the sin. I can't just do these new things. Well, what does that look like? How can I do that? And I, again, I'll remind you, effort isn't bad. It just doesn't work on its own. But the secret to crucifying the flesh, the secret to doing what Paul says here in Galatians 5, isn't found in effort alone. It's found in a new identity. It's found in a rewiring. It's found in a new mind, a transforming, a new molding that happens in our minds. You see, in this series, we've been talking about the Trinity. The Holy Spirit comes and works in us to produce this fruit, to produce abundance. But the way that we do that, the way that we crucify the flesh is to look to the one who's been crucified, the one in whom we see God, the Son. It's a deeper discipline than just effort. It's a discipline called meditating on the gospel, feeding on the gospel, the reality, the gospel truth of Jesus every single day. Paul says this, just a couple of chapters earlier, in chapter 2, verse 20, it says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Our crucifixion of the flesh, our killing of the flesh, is only possible when we look to him who has killed the flesh when we look to Jesus, when we set our eyes on what he's done. This past week, I got back from our Maranatha trip, which is our, our big middle school trip that happens every year. And it's, it's an amazing trip because we took, I think, 170 middle school students to this camp in Nebraska from all three campuses at Calvary. So over 200 people, including leaders, go. And you'll see the vans and the coach buses just pulling out, and you're like, what is going, what is the military doing in Erie, Colorado? Like, you just see this stream of buses and vans pulling out. But it's amazing to see the way that God works in the lives of our students on trips like these. I mean, so many decisions, so many life changes happen on trips like these. And as somebody who works with students, we're constantly asking the question, why are these trips so impactful? What makes them worth it? They're a lot of work. They cost a lot of money. What makes them worth it? 
And we see the lives changed from trips like this. We see the transformation that happens when students come back. But why do they make such an impact? It must be magic. It's magic. There's just something magical about it. It must be the blob and the slip and slide. That's what it is. No, it's, these students go from experiencing maybe an hour or two hours a week with God to suddenly experiencing five hours a day intentionally with God. Whoa. There was this study done by a professor at the University of Kansas who wanted to know, when does genuine friendship form? How do we know when a friendship has passed from a casual acquaintance to a true, trustworthy friend? And so he did a number of studies and and interviewed a number of students, I mean, tons of them, and the conclusions that he came to was that it takes about 30 to 50 hours for a casual acquaintance. 30 to 50 hours He said it takes about 100 hours for a real friend to develop. 100 hours. It's a lot of time. If you were to hang out for two hours, you have to do that 50 times. But the real threshold, when you reach the closest friendships, like only a handful of these in your whole life, it takes upwards of 200 to 300 hours of time with that person. That's what it takes for true trust and friendship to happen. And so when students get five hours of time intentionally with God, we're like, whoa, this must be magic. It's euphoria, what is going on here? There's no explanation for this. Could it be that they've spent all this time with God, walking with him, being led by him, It's a miracle, but it's not magic. It takes time, it takes reliance, it takes takes physical presence, it takes intentionality to walk and to be led by the Spirit to see the work that Jesus has done and to meditate and feed on the truth of who he is and be changed by him. This morning, We're gonna take a minute to do just that with communion. And I'm gonna ask Pastor Zach to come up and lead us to that time in just a moment here. But this morning as we do communion, let us look to Christ. Let us look to the work he's done yielding and surrendering our lives, our control, our power, our agendas to him that he might work in us.